Hamakani, Hamaya Bemi, Nishinanamimi Wakamni, Lydam Lily Yapemni, Ustama Hedidi. Hello, I'm Shelley Covert. I'm the spokesperson for the Nevada City Ranchery and Nisanan Tribe. I'm also the executive director of CHIRP, which is the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project. And that is the nonprofit that supports the Nevada City Ranchery and Nisanan Tribe. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate Nisanan culture. And the space that we're in today is Ubaseu, which is the original Nisanan word for Yuba River. We are standing in the middle of our newest exhibit, which is erased. Gold was discovered in Nisanan territory and Nisanan waterways. Uh, our culture has bit, just been completely erased. Only about 2% of the Nisanan people actually survived the genocide against the California Indians here. And that um, history is not really known to a lot of people. That's what this exhibit really brings forward. This is specifically talking about Nisanan territory in Northern California, the extraction of gold, the extraction of fur, um, any natural resource that was available here, and it's quick and speedy export to other countries, and it resulted in the erasure of our people. A piece for me that is very important is not only does it bring it really into one room where we can see it all collectively, but we are the descendants of that 2% of the population that survived, and strangely, we're the ones that are educating folks. <laughs> we're the ones that are educating our community um, that this history be told, that this history be taught in our schools, that it be included in our landscape here, our homelands that were our, this was our place for thousands and thousands of years. It talks about the gold rush, the disappearance of the Nisenam people through paid genocide campaigns against the people. It talks about the boarding schools. It talks about the legislation uh, that prohibited voting, citizenship. It's all here. Yeah, I hope, you know, this virtual tour that you're going to be seeing really lights something in you because it is our history. It's a collective history. It may have happened to our people, but today in this country, it is our history. So I hope you enjoy. So here behind me is the timeline. And on this side, you'll see when we zoom in, it's, it's really the tribal perspective of time, which it wasn't until I was actually putting the timeline together that I realized I'm trying to squish like thousands of years of culture and history into you know this little tiny chunk of time, which is what we're all living in now. Um, and this is an ancient culture. So we speak of time immemorial. There's a time before humans were here when it was just the animals here. 
and the animals are always our teachers. From them we learn, uh, like from the bear, we learn how to mother and uh, our protection and our um, territorial instincts really are from these animals. Humans are always the dumb ones, <laughs> you know? Humans are always the ones who are not prepared to live in nature. And we don't have claws, we don't have our meat tearing fangs, we don't have fur, we don't have great eyesight like the hawk or hearing or the smell that animals do. So the animals are the ancient ones and then there's this time before time when you know none of this was here. So it was, it was really difficult for me to try to squish all that in a timeline when it's beyond time itself. So there's the perspective of the tribe, what we have here, these countless generations. We always consider the seventh generation or the unborn generations. Uh, and that's, you know, I got that from my grandpa and, and including people in the decisions that are made. If it's going to harm someone, what is it going to change? What's our impact going to be? And a lot of times, um, the answer was just, if it's gonna harm somebody, you just don't do it, period. Um, and these so things you will see are those moments that truly impacted the tribe so heavily after these thousands of generations of stability, and I've been calling it perpetual motion with nature, true sustainability. And humans are not at the top of that ladder. You know, we, our grizzlies are no longer here, our condor, the salmon, the great panthers that um, really shape this landscape, the huge herds of elk and antelope. You know, we look at our forests now and they're in such a dire need, but we had huge herds that sometimes took a day to pass by that you know how they do, they eat as they go. Their impact on tending the forest and being stewards of the land is absolutely, um, I think it's, hard to measure that <laughs> you know it's just humans now so um but you'll see things like the donner party things like the termination of our tribe you'll see um you know of course the discovery of gold in Nisan on waterways and how that impacted and changed our culture and i guess my desire with all of these things is to as we zoom in and you can read these things for yourself. You know, imagine if you were the people who all of these things were happening to. And you know, there's a 98% success of genocide in Northern California and in many parts of California where people were paid for the extermination of the red race, you know. And if you could just imagine that happening to you and, you know, I'm a descendant of those, that 2% survivors. And, and just read these things, you know, if you can, with an open heart. And imagine that we're still here. This isn't a thing, this isn't a fight of the past. This is a fight that's still happening now. And that I'm in any shape to be the one educating people. I always laugh because I'm like, if it's me, you know, we're, geez, poor people. <laughs> like, um, but, you know, and here we are, we're still here. And yet we're, we're able to share this perspective of how we're living today. And let's take a look at ourselves and this inclusive history that's so very important. And, you know, there's a little justice to be served still, you know, awaiting um, when's that going to happen for us? When's somebody going to say, you're right, that all is really terrible. Here, let's federally recognize you. Give your recognition back that was taken so illegally, you know, you'll see here in 1964. <laughs> so, um, so please read it with an open heart. Put yourself in our shoes. And um, what can we do to, you know, make some change? All right. So Time immemorial. The Nisenon concept of time is different from ours today. It recognizes vast arcs of existence and worlds before the creation of humans. Animals are older. They were here long before us and are better equipped for life in nature. Modern science states Nisenon existence here back at least 13,000 years, but our creation stories recognize a much, much older time a time beyond time itself.
Nature greater than everything. Nature. Oh, earth. A tribe's culture is intertwined with the geography of their homelands. Their art, clothing, regalia, food, contempi represent the native plant and animal species around them. Despite being a peaceful and non-warring tribe, the Nisenan levy severe consequences for any action that threatens to upset the delicate balance between the Indian and nature. Grandchildren of our grandchildren's grandchildren. Tradition and protocol thoughtfully evolve over thousands of years. Experience gained through trial and error add to the community's knowledge base as each generation molds themselves to the earth. Longevity, order, balance, stability. The well-being of those yet to be born factors into all tribal decisions. Sustainable existence is dependent on both generations before and after. Affluence and diversity. Conservatively more than 300,000 indigenous people with linguistically and culturally distinct tribal societies exist throughout the entirety of what will eventually become the state of California. In Nisenan territory, the people were wealthy not only because of the great bounty provided from nature, but the tribe's ability to navigate a sustainable lifestyle within the natural order. The land and its people. Over thousands of years, the Nisenan explored ways to perfect their connection with this land and its many beings. Nearly all of this experience, sophistication, and symbiotic evolution with nature was violently disappeared under the weight of colonialism, forced assimilation, religious conversion, enslavement, environmental obliteration, and genocide. The Fall of the Ancient Savage brutality accompanies the northward advancement and invasion of this hemisphere. Hence fall the ancient civilizations of the Mayan, Inca, and Aztec. Anahuac is overthrown and will eventually become known as Mexico. 1819, Funded Erasure. Congress passes the Civilization Fund Act. These funds are provided to Christian-run benevolent societies as annuities to stimulate the civilization process. 1806 to 1830, fur exploitation. Populations of sea otters, river otters, beaver, mink, and others experience a total population collapse during the years of the fur rush. Some have never recovered. 1846 and 47, cannibalized. Luis and Salvador are two Indian boys sent to find and help the Donner Party after they were stranded on the Sierra Pass. The two boys are skilled scouts and they were shot down and consumed by William Foster, who later founded Foster's Bar, which is now under Bullard's Bar Dam. 1848, discovery in Nisenam waterways. The soft but heavy metal has always been in these waters. The elders say it makes a good slingshot rock and fishing net weight. It is also said that it can make you sick. The tribes whose ancestral homelands are within gold country experience the brunt of the destruction. There is no law, no one to stand in the way of depravity put upon the Indians, animals, and land. There is no one to enforce even the most basic ethical, moral, or kind act. eighteen forty nine and the extermination of the red race. The first governor of California calls for the extermination of the Native Americans and funded by the federal government, the state of California pays bounties for native body parts. Governor Burnett is a slave owner, a Chinese exclusion act enthusiast. He signed into law the Indian Protection Act. He's a field merchant from Missouri, heavily in debt, failed agricultural endeavors in Oregon, 
and the author of Burnett's Lash Law. You really should check that one out. 1850 Protection of the Indians. The first session of California State Legislature signs this act legalizing forced servitude of California Indians. Further, it promotes racism, violence, and legal disempowerment, robbing the Indians of any legal authority to defend themselves, their land, possessions, or family. The 1851 Unratified California Treaties. The Nisenan signed the Camp Union Treaty near the Yuba River. In exchange for their land, its resources, and containment to a reservation, they will receive a 12 by 12 square mile tract of land near Penn Valley and Rough and Ready. On this reservation, they may live forever. But in a secret session of the Senate, they decide not to ratify the treaties and instead they are hidden away until they were accidentally rediscovered in 1904. 1861 to 1865. Gold from our homelands fund the Civil War. The gold taken from unceded Indian territory shapes this country and the statehood of California. Further, its impact affects the outcome of the Mexican-American and Civil Wars. This fact has yet to be acknowledged by the state of California and the United States of America. And here's a quote from Ulysses S. Grant. I do not know what we would do in this great national emergency were it not for the gold sent from California. Over $1.1 billion taken in 1864 alone was sent to support the Civil War. 1862, the Homestead Act. Here we have another presidential quote from Abraham Lincoln. The act is worthy of consideration and that the wild lands of the country should be distributed so that every man should have the means and opportunity of benefiting his condition. This was another way to get people to come west. The quote unquote free Indian land, you know, the people were removed from the land so that other men could have the land. 1860 to 1978, the stolen generations of the Indian boarding schools. Kill the Indian, save the man. The boarding schools were started on the bones of the Civilization Fund Act. It's said that if you know a Native person, either their parents or their grandparents were taken away and put in Indian boarding school. The numbers are staggering and the stories are just as horrible. 1887, the Dawes Act. The Dawes is another act that allowed for huge land openings for non-native people to come and take communal Indian land. And in 1932, quote unquote, whites owned two thirds of the 138 million acres that was previously held by Native American tribes. Surviving the Tides, Invaders, Immigrants, Emigrants, Settlers. The native populations of California have survived in their homeland since time immemorial. Their land has been discovered over and over again. The indigenous people of the world fall to the brutal and cruel hands of invaders from around the planet. The land falls to extraction, overhunting, an unsustainable population. Things would be so amazingly different had newcomers been kind and sought peace instead of an authoritarian rule. We believe we are democracy, but as long as we are destroying the very planet that gives us life, we will continue to repeat the past and our lands will fall. This is the next section, 
after the timeline. And this is land and legal illegalities. <laughs> so we have a lot of the maps that are very important to show the continuous removal of the native people. 287, actually that's attached to that Camp Union Treaty. And the Royce number is 287 for this area. We've also just started our own GIS mapping system and we're getting it populated and it's really, really exciting. There in the brown frame, that's our actual termination papers of when they terminated the reservation. And another map and then there you can see Estumiani, which is our sacred mountain. And as we continue to look around this room here, I'll mention a few things that hadn't made it onto the timeline quite yet. In 1924, there was the Indian Citizenship Act, and this granted citizenship to all Indians born in the United States. I'm not sure where else Indians would be born, but that citizenship did not include the right to vote authority given to the states to determine whether native people in their state can vote or not. And Utah was the last to allow native to vote in 1962. Another thing that's not in the timeline yet is the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. Tribes with federal recognition are given the opportunity to reorganize themselves under a more modern tribal council instead of traditional kinship systems. Tribes are given the right to operate tribal corporations, and that's in quotes, under their own management. And this act also created a modern constitution and governing structure. So here in Nisenan territory, we were absolutely led by kinship. Uh, you had to be of good character. You couldn't be greedy. You had to be a people person. Women could also be leaders. Women were called Mayan, and the men were called Hook. The 1934 Reorganization Act is what caused a lot of warring with some tribes between their traditional leadership and what some people call the BIA Indians because they were these sometimes these tribal councils were put in place by the Bureau of Indian Affairs themselves to gain access to the different resources that a given tribe has on their reservation land. In 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed. Prior to this act, it was illegal for an Indian to believe or perform any act of traditional religious rites, spiritual or cultural practice. 1978, not 1878, not 1778, 1978. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act provides the right to access sacred sites, the freedom to worship through traditional ceremonial rites, and allows the possession and use of objects traditionally considered sacred by their respective cultures. Also, another biggie in the Indian Act world, 1978, the Indian Child Welfare Act, also known as ICWA, ICWA shields American Indian youth from being removed from their families and tribes. Nearly 35% of all Native American children are being raised in adoptive homes, foster homes, and institutions. These non-Indian environments strip the children of their families and their cultural identities. In 2021, the number of Native children in foster homes remains high. Many see it as a continuation of the boarding schools, just with a different shape and name. And skipping around a bit on the timeline, 1913, 
federal recognition. Bill Rolfe Douglas, a founder of Laurel Parlor No. 6, Native Daughters of the Golden West, is an advocate for the local tribe. She is also part of the suffragette movement and politically connected. When Chief Charlie Cully passes away in 1913, Bell is instrumental in not only protecting Cully's Indian land allotment for the tribe's communal use, but getting the attention of President Woodrow Wilson. 75 and a half acres of land are taken into trust and the tribe is given federal recognition creating the Nevada City Rancheria. 75 and a half acres on Cement Hill just outside of Nevada City. It is sovereign tribal land and it is its own self-governing tribal government. And another little interesting fact, uh, they deeded away a half acre of the reservation land for the building of the Nevada City Airport. So Bell Douglas is one of my heroines. And now we're into the back section, which is a pop out that talks about the boarding schools. So this book you're looking at right now has a genealogy record. It's a census record that has my grandpa Dutch and his siblings on it. He was 10 years old in this census, but he had been there for many years. The impact of the Indian boarding schools is still everlasting. It's that historical trauma that is passed down in Native families so often. It's one of the things that CHIRP is looking at, supporting the tribe to get oh, different programs in place to identify what this historic trauma is and how it lives inside of us how it lives inside of us, even the ones of us who think that, you know, we're, we're floating okay. The, the depth, I guess, of the water, you know, that you're floating in, <laughs> you don't always know um, what's down there. But the historical trauma from the abuse that happened at these boarding schools is, is lingering, certainly. My grandpa's brother died at Indian boarding school in Kansas, I believe, Haskell, and his body was never brought home. We know now that our new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, is looking into the boarding schools finally. She is the one who also started an investigation on the missing and murdered Indigenous women. The numbers of people who go missing from the Native American communities is so staggering. And I saw somebody say once that natives are throwaway people. Like you don't even, you don't even make the news. <laughs> you know, and a lot of these boarding schools are out, or pardon, a lot of the reservations are out in the middle of nowhere with these big, you know, national highways going right through the middle of them. And there's no one accountable. And the tribal councils and the tribal people are probably maxed out poor with no capacity. And what are they supposed to do? It's been very recent now that Indian tribal courts can persecute and prosecute for things like this that happen on tribal lands, which is pretty incredible given the circumstances. Uh, this wall we're looking at right now is the cultural side of the exhibit. And I hope it stands in contrast to show at least a little bit of what has been lost over and over and over again. As soon as something good happens, the rug is pulled out. And I don't even have all of the legislation and legal actions against any people up in the exhibit. It was just too overwhelming. And the strange thing is that I know these things. That's how I was able to guide our team, you know, to, to try to get it on my head and get it up on the walls. 
because I really feel that none of us know about this history. We don't, we're not taught about it in schools. It's not common talk on the streets. And I always feel that nobody is to blame for this, especially if you don't know about it. So it was really my hope to get it or at least a lot of it up in one place where we can all see it. And then maybe we can talk about it together as a community. I think, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter and all these social justice movements that are happening today are paving the path that maybe these injustices can be seen for what they are. And then it's gone on so much longer than for everybody else. And it's never been addressed. I was telling somebody the other day that it feels like you're in a sci-fi movie like The Matrix or something where you're the only one that has a memory of something and nobody else has any day any idea what you're talking about or they think you're lying or you know playing a fiddle and trying to feel sorry for yourself or something. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, this exhibit. I think we could probably do a single exhibit on every one of these things, you know, every time we put an exhibit up. This could be the topic. It would get really sad after a while. Um, it, it's, it's a lot. It's just a lot to know about. And then it feels a lot of the times like nobody else knows. And by that not knowing... It feels like nobody else really cares or, you know, hey, why don't you guys get over it? it was so long ago, but it's ongoing. You know, for when the land was taken and those treaties were never ratified, I mean, that was just kind of the, you know, <laughs> the topping on the cake or whatever. I, I can't believe that any of us are even still here to have this conversation. And we are, and we still have a lot of our culture left. We're not fully assimilated. Maybe we're just stubborn. But what matters most is, of course, our culture and our families, but this land and the animals and the trees and the water. And I know it sounds like cliche, like I'm a tree hugger and a, you know, a feather wearing native person or whatever, but it's the absolute truth. I think we're still here so that we can remind people that we're on a living planet that has likes and dislikes. And if you engage, you know, that's where the stories come from. Like, oh, go talk to a tree, you know, if you need guidance or wisdom or something. <laughs> you know, go sit in the river and let it take your cares away. Because it really does. And nature likes to have people there. I'm sure when they're not clear cutting and fracking and <laughs> doing horrible, horrible things, maybe I would have to rephrase that. But for the most part, we're the ones with thumbs. We're the ones that are supposed to help burn the landscape because the bugs are so intense. And if you burn the landscape, the bugs aren't as bad and they don't eat your food. And the basket materials and the foods are pliable and delicious and tender. And what are we without our planet? Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. There, I, I looked back up at the video again. That's our little donation sign. It says, Winim Honim Ni. And the last section uh, was that of federal recognition. And we're still fighting the fight. I think that any one of the those cards up on the wall in that timeline <laughs> should be enough to for someone to say, you're right. Here's your recognition back. And here's some land and your burial grounds. And wouldn't that be a good day?